Welcome back to Exercise Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss some basic functions of a dipeptide referred to as carnosine, which is important in skeletal muscle. And we're also going to discuss, in fact, first, we're going to discuss its biosynthesis, ultimately from the pyrimidine uracil, which we know when in the nucleotide form is actually found in RNAs. All right, so let's begin with the biosynthetic pathway for carnosine. Like we mentioned, uh, uracil is actually a pyrimidine that's found ultimately as a base, a nitrogenous base, in RNAs. Well, nucleotides are degraded just like any other uh, macromolecule is. And so ultimately, when the uracil part of the nucleotide is released from the, from the ribose, uracil in excess will be degraded. And this pathway of uracil degradation ultimately leads to uh, the production of an amino acid called beta alanine. Now, be very careful. This is not the typical alanine that we see in proteins, one of the 20 proteinogenic amino acids. That's actually alpha alanine. Remember that those amino acids are alpha amino acids. If you looked at alanine structure, the typical alanine, alpha that is, you would see that the amine would actually be attached to this carbon right here, and then there would just be a simple methyl group sticking off of that. So a different structure. Instead, the amine is actually bound to the beta carbon of this molecule. Okay, so different amino acid. This one is not found in proteins. All right, uracil is first uh, ultimately reduced by this enzyme, which is called dihydropyrimidine dehydrogenase. The double bond over here, at least as we've drawn it, on the left side of uracil is ultimately going to be reduced with the hydrogen ultimately from NADPH. We get an NADP out of it, and then this molecule called 5,6-dihydrouracil. All right. Now, dihydrouracil is going to be degraded further by a hydrolytic enzyme called dihydropyrimidinase. We see the water coming in here, and it's ultimately going to bust up this molecule, decyclize it into this molecule called ureidopropionic acid or ureidopropionate. Okay. Um, ultimately, what's going to happen is this moiety over here, this NH2 with the carbon and double bond oxygen, this is ultimately going to be removed as ammonia and CO2, and that's going to be catalyzed by ureidopropionase, or ureidopropionase, okay? And that removal is going to be catalyzed by water, hydro hydrolytic reaction, and ultimately this business over here on the right side of the molecule is going to be what's left, and that's going to be the molecule beta-alanine, which as we said just a minute ago, that is a non-proteinogenic amino acid, so it's not found in proteins, but it's vital in skeletal muscle physiology, okay? Now, beta-alanine doesn't do a whole lot by itself. Um, you can actually purchase beta-alanine supplements at the store. I actually take beta-alanine uh, before I actually do a resistance training workout. Um, it's one of those... Uh, amino acid supplements that you're, it's actually purported to work. It's one of the ergogenic ones that you can take prior to a workout. And we'll talk about why that is in just a minute. But note that it's actually not directly beta alanine that's actually causing the positive ergogenic effects on exercise. It's actually, it's metabolite carnosine. Now, the GI here is just if you take the beta alanine directly as a supplement. In general, the beta alanine, biosynthetically speaking, is going to be synthesized by the liver. And so the liver is going to dump that into the blood, and then it's going to travel to the muscle. And the muscle is actually going to take up that beta alanine through transporters in the cell membrane. All right. Once the muscle cell takes up the beta alanine, there's an enzyme in the sarcoplasm, in the cytoplasm of the muscle cell, called carnosine synthase. What carnosine synthase does is it catalyzes the condensation of beta alanine, specifically it's the uh, carboxyl of beta alanine, to the alpha amine of histidine. And so ultimately what you get when you condense those is you get this amino acid, it's really a dipeptide I should say, and that is carnosine. And when you take a beta alanine supplement or your liver makes the beta alanine and delivers it to the muscle, it's not really the beta alanine that's having any direct effect on exercise. It's actually the carnosine. In fact, if you go to most drugstores, they will actually sell carnosine directly. 
I prefer to take the beta alanine, and there, but there's there's some evidence for both of those. But let's find out what carnosine does. All right, so let's actually go through uh, this list of very important functions, and there might be some others depending on the text that you're looking at. So first of all, if we wanted an ideal buffer, as in something to resist pH changes, for the sarcoplasm of a skeletal muscle cell. Now remember, there's a lot of important things in the sarcoplasm. Uh, for example, we've got all of the, the sarcomeres, right? We've got the troponin, the tropomyosin, the actin, the myosin, and so maintaining pH is extremely important for that purpose. So an ideal muscle buffer would be between 6.5 and 7.1, and that is the pKa should be between 6.5 and 7.1. It turns out that carnosine has a pKa of about 6.8, and if you think about this mathematically, that is smack dab right in the middle of these two numbers. So carnosine is actually a better buffer for skeletal muscle than uh, phosphates. In fact, if we look at if we think about the phosphate buffer system, which is really the buffer system in most uh, cytoplasms. Phosphate actually has one pKa that's a 7.2. That's actually slightly outside of that range. And so the nice thing about this carnosine is it is right in the middle of that range for optimum buffering. And that's important for muscles in particular because muscles are some of the most metabolic, metabolically active cells that we have in our body. Uh, some people would call them the workhorses of the body because when we start doing exercise, the, there's not a lot of uh, tissues that appreciably change. I mean, yes, you have uh, blood that's being shunted to the skin, the heart beats faster, um, but most other things are either shut down or just maintained. For instance, blood flow to the brain, more or less just maintained. The skeletal muscles, their activity skyrockets, and with increasing exercise intensity, it goes up more and more. So we need a really effective buffer for muscles, and having something with, a, with such an, a fantastic pKa right in the middle of the optimum range, carnosine does the job well. The other thing that it's going to be able to do is act as an antioxidant. This histidine imidazole ring right here, uh, can actually accept and donate electrons, single electrons from uh, free radicals such as hydrogen peroxide, if we have a superoxide type of radical, um, or if we just happen to have uh, hydroxyl radicals. Then this imidazole ring can actually pick those up and quench them, and it won't be able to cause as much oxidative damage in the cell. And that's going to be able to occur in both the blood, where we actually are going to have some amount of carnitine, but mostly it's going to be in the muscle, all right? Now another property of carnosine is, is its ability to act as an anti-glycating agent or its anti-glycation. Now first of all, what is glycation? This is something that most people don't know about. Glycation is the process by which a, a, a sugar, normally we're talking about glucose, becomes covalently bound to something and it's normally a protein, normally one of the amino acid residues of a protein. A great example of glycation that you would hear about in medical talk or medical lingo is A1C. You probably have seen some commercials on TV that advertise a drug that lowers your A1C levels. Doctors, when you get to a certain age, they'll start checking your A1C. What A1C is, is it's basically damaged hemoglobin in your blood. So hemoglobin has lysine residues, that is the protein component of hemoglobin. And those lysine residues can actually, if there's a lot of glucose in the blood, usually as a result of high sugary diets, or meals that cause hyperglycemia, glucose can actually become covalently bound to those lysine residues, all right? And if you remember, glucose normally exists as a cyclic structure, it's a ring, but it's in equilibrium with its linear structure in which it has an aldehyde functional group. That aldehyde is very reactive. It's not really that reactive in its ring form, but in its straight chain uh, acyclic form, that aldehyde's very reactive. And the lysine, which has a, an NH2 very similar to this, can actually react with that aldehyde and form a covalent bond. When that happens, you have glycation, and that causes protein damage, and over time it can cause other things like severe inflammation. So in carnosine, particularly this amine right here on the beta alanine component of it over here, this amine can actually pick up reactive aldehydes, which could either be from glucose if, it's, if we're talking about in the blood. Carnosine won't have a very high amount in the blood, but when you do consume it, it will be there for some amount of time. But inside the muscle cell, this amine can pick up, let's say, formaldehyde, the most reactive, and then the second most, which is acetaldehyde, a byproduct of uh, alcohol metabolism in humans.
All right, so that's another important function of this carnosine. Two other functions which I won't spend too much time on are it's an activator of the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, which is going to be important in the metabolism and interconversion of protons for uh, uh, changing the acidity of the blood and carbon dioxide. This can actually help clear acid from the muscle and re release it as carbon dioxide into the blood where it will be exhaled as part of the respiratory system. Um, and then it also can chelate metal ions and affect their concentrations as, as well. Remember, chelation is the process when two Lewis bases, at least two, it can be more than that, but they come together and they attach to usually a transition metal. Um, the lone pair on this nitrogen of the beta alanine component of carnosine, and then this lone pair that would actually be on this nitrogen of the imidazole ring. Remember, this molecule is flexible, and so those two nitrogens can come in close proximity, and they can chelate or sort of hold a metal ion in place, and, and they can effectively change its concentration there. Okay? So these are some of the important functions of carnosine in skeletal muscle. Um, I would probably argue that these first three, and especially the first one with the, the buffering, those are going to be the most important functions of carnosine. And again, if you think about why this is important, particularly for muscle cells and not as much for other cells, it's because muscles are extremely metabolically active. They're going to be producing a lot of uh, byproducts of metabolism, such as formaldehyde and other reactive carbonyl species. They're going to producing, be producing a lot of free radicals because their electron transport chain is going to be going full force. And also, they're going to be building up a lot of acid potentially, and so that you need an effective buffering species. So carnosine is an, is an excellent molecule to have a lot of in your muscles. Okay, and then we also went over this biosynthetic pathway, and hopefully it makes sense how the liver can actually make this beta alanine and also we can get it as a supplement form, and then ultimately it's gonna end up through the blood into the muscle where it will be packaged with histidine into carnosine by this enzyme, the carnosine synthase. All right, so hopefully this video made sense to you. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.